So that would be me, uh, Michael Lesnik, as she said, and we're going to talk a little bit about virality. And it's a topic on its own, that it's one of those that everybody knows about it, but when it comes to the point of application, of point of using it, there are quite a lot of different opinions, and there are quite a lot of different ways of doing it. So I'm going to try to talk about one of them, and I'm going to try to explain that it's actually easier to do than it should be. First of all, virality is not a disease. There is nothing wrong about virality, although it comes from the word virus. So although it comes from the word virus, there is nothing wrong about it. So that generally, the idea is that how your game or how your any news or whatever you do, how does it propagate? And then in comparison with the virology, which is the science, so they came out with the singular concept of the things propagating through people talking about it, the, the word of mouse. And this is how they come to the world of virality. Although when it came to the marketing, the other word popped out, and that is K factor. And I really have no any idea why does it call K factor, but that's how everybody in the marketing area refers to it. Okay? So virality, it's an average number of people infected by one patient. Was anything ever was viral? Probably you remember Pokemon Go. That was a crazy viral story. Grand Theft Auto. <coughs> Jetpack, Angry Birds, all those things were definitely viral success. They were huge viral success. How big they were? Well, that's one of the scenes in the Central Park. People are looking for the Pokemon, and there was a huge stampede, and people were kind of trying to get there. And if you've seen this video, I'm not, I'm not sure I can project videos here, but if you, you can go on YouTube and try to type something like Vaporeon in the Central Park, and you will see that was a one hell broken loose. Okay, so that's that's definitely viral. That's definitely something that works. Yes, and that's definitely something that helps you to make money because if it's viral, many people are downloading it. You don't need to pay for those downloads, and that's actually free money that you can make. Yeah. So, how to make it viral? In general, just make a good app. Yeah, that that would that sure would be viral. But there are ways, there are tools. There is a formal approach of doing it. So first of all, it must be easy to access, and uh, you can look you can look at the things. And this is definitely a product design. When things are easy to access, when things are appealing to a user to use, such and they have attractive content they definitely, there is a good chance that they would become viral. But then you can help it, of course, becoming viral. And, this, and those are communication channels, and this is what we would try to talk about and how to measure those things. So easy transfers to each other. And uh, old days, I mean old days, four or five years ago, before Facebook 2.0, Facebook was a great platform for virality. Nothing was limited and people could communicate and send messages without those algorithms that Facebook has implemented stopping it in a way. And that was a real, real nice story out of which, for instance, Zynga has profited quite a lot at their time. Now, the other thing you can encourage virality, and that's one of the things is that the, the sharing has got meaning. So when somebody is sending your app or somebody is sending a message and it has got a meaning, it's not just because they want to bug their friends and tell, hey, this is a great thing, but there is something behind it. Okay, let's, let's play together, let's do something. This is something, a present from me to you, something like that. So sharing has meaning. And the other thing, if you can, uh, like any other virus, try to parasite on existing communication channels, Instead of creating your own, that's a good thing. So Facebook was definitely a good solution to it. So now they kind of trying to limit it here and there, but there are other platforms which will come down, to, which will come up. Okay. So how do you measure K factor? And this is where you want to do because you want to understand, you want to assess it. You're, you have your app. It's, it's bringing in stalls, and what you want to understand, you want to plan, you want to understand how much money to spend, and what will be the added value of the virality that you have. And this is the most simple formula. K factor equals I times C, where I is an average number of invitations sent by one user, C is an average conversion. So, as we said, in, in the virusology, number of patients infected by one patient. Yes. So that's, that's K factor, that's great. So you can do it like this, but there are 
there are limitations and let's try to take a look at what they might be and what actually the story behind them might be. Yeah? So what's the good k factor? Well, generally greater than one. If it's greater than one, that means it covers your churn, it means your app is growing and it's growing for free. This is the most important thing. Yes, so the blue line is a great line, green, green line is a bad line, the red line is so-so, so you're surviving. But the one thing you, let, you have to remember that virality dies down. As any other virus dies, I mean, you, you're up and, and the news about you're up and other things are dying down. So this is where you have to stimulate it further and further and further. So that's another thing. Okay, so, but what about internet? So in internet, generally, when you talk about user acquisition, you would talk about virality as a number of organic downloads per period T divided by active users per period T minus one, or some might divide it by the number of paid installs at the period T minus one. And then you're kind of saying, okay, each paid install brings me, I don't know, three free installs, great. And then you multiply it by your lifetime value of your player and you see like, okay, so for every install I'm making, I can actually make three, four times more. And this is where you start to measure it. So that's definitely something. But then you have lots of questions, quite a lot. I mean, what time period to consider? Is it in a week? Is it in a month? Is it, what, what, what is it that you want? Yes, and then there are all sorts of business things that are tr you're trying to answer. How to evaluate the cycles? I mean, is it the lifetime value of a player? Not, not value, but the lifetime of how long do they play? How to measure attribution? Who is it bringing to whom, I mean? Because the next thing you want to do, you want to find those central, central centers of virality and you want to kind of bring them again to your new game and to other things. And what does it mean from practical point of view? Yeah, so, I mean, as I said, I mean, if I'm getting user for free, so that's an added value. If I'm getting two, three, four, but am I getting them in a one year? Am I getting them in a month? Am I getting them in a week? So all those formulas, they are great. They can give you some sort of understandings but they would be very, very difficult for you if you want to build on it, if you want to build on it for your next product. Of course, you can use some sort of benchmark, but still it might be very difficult, okay? And then take a look, I mean, yeah, so let's take a look on the graph on the left and the graph on the right, yes? So the number of installs is the same, but something should tell you that the graph on the left is somehow better than the graph on the right, and if you would kind of make an intuitive assumption here, you would say, hey, actually the graph on the right would be faster propagating than the graph on the left. And that kind of already puts you into idea that, okay, so if that user A, the one on the, on the left, let's call them an A, he can infect the other two users, but actually it could have been much faster, yes. So this is how somehow you start to realize that, you know what, if I know the underlying structure of my users, and this is what we said in our second slide, if people can share and share has got a meaning, so then you can track those sharings. So if one sends a message to another one, and then the, the other player installs as a result of it, or makes a purchase as a result of it, or performs any other action, which is in a, in a way that you're seeking for. So actually, you can already start to build graphs because those messages can be treated as vertices. And if you can start to build graph, you can actually evaluate graph because this is the formal thing. We know how to evaluate graphs. That's not something unheard of. Yeah? So that's any student in university can tell you that you can evaluate graphs. Okay. So, okay, so if you have graph, Let's try to take a look what we are looking for in the graph and what we, what we are trying to achieve through that graph, okay? So, so what are those things? And you can see all sorts of different types of graphs down there. So closed triad, open triad, connected pair, unconnected pair. And again, intuitively, you would think like, you know what, closed triad is probably something good and unconnected pair is probably something not good because if everybody is standalone, they are not communicating with each other. And if they are not communicating with each other, they are in the quarantine, speaking in the viral terminology, and they are not infecting each other, yes. And, and, and then when you look back at it again, you see like actually in 1908, long before we knew the word graph and long before we had computers, somebody already said that actually people when they are getting into the com companies of three, it's actually a good thing. 
they are they are becoming some sort of unit they are becoming something that is actually much longer existing than for instance only pair so the third individual becomes a some sort of source of balance between them and becoming second opinion and calming nerves so yeah okay so if two playing game the third one can actually probably in a, a referee or can be some somebody who will push them play forward so that's something else okay so Triads, cliques, that's another thing. So that's, don't mess with our cliques. Yeah? So that's, is, are, are, are cliques are actually a bad thing? Well, yes, if it's a political cliques or if it's a, some other gangs of some sort, but we are actually looking for different cliques here. And cliques in graphs, again, can be different things, but the general point of clique is that when you look for a definition of clique, you can see that you cannot add any more vertices to the graph without actually breaking it connection and that's a closed clique so that's a closed environment so take a look so for instance here you have one clique here you have another one another one and then another one and it's, and it's quite obvious that if you infect this user so this one will get very quickly infected too <coughs> infected and giving them up okay so it's not not really infecting them so and, and if you give it to this one so that can propagate this. So if you can identify this graph structure, all of a sudden you can make conclusions. You can start to understand what are you doing. Yes. So what we should we do then? So the simplest is a non-trivial case of a clique, it's a triangle. That's a very, very simple thing. So if your graphs are organized in <coughs> triangles, that's a good thing. If your graphs are organized in a pairs or unconnected pairs, that's not such a good thing. That's very cool, and did anybody work with graph before in here? Yeah, so it's a non-polynomial problem, and it requires huge, huge computational power. So evaluating graphs is not cheap, and it's very, very difficult. So anybody will say to me, yeah, great, dude, this is theory, but actually, you know what? I mean, it takes Facebook one night to, to count triangles over their graph. And that was the case till a certain point when this thing came out, and that's called graph chain. And that's quite a story that if I have enough time, I can tell you. So the guy, Aapa Kirola, he was doing his PhD, I think it was in Carnegie Mellon. And he has developed quite a unique algorithm. He has developed quite a unique platform for graph computations. And using this platform, you can actually do quite a miraculous things when it comes to graphs, okay? It's a quite novelty, and it's a very interesting thing. And uh, when the first time I've, I've seen it, it was in one of the conferences, and it was quite funny because Facebook engineers came out and said that it takes us with all our cluster one night to calculate triangles, and then this guy comes out and says it takes me 20 minutes to calculate triangles on the whole Facebook graph on one laptop. So, okay, so that was interesting, so let's try to see, okay? So, how does it work? Little bit for the tech nerds around, okay? So, uh, allow me. So, the, <coughs> it's simple, it splits the graph, it knows how to split the graph into shards, or bits and pieces, and then it just evaluates them in the loops, each shard separately, and then optimizing between them. And through this, the, the main reason why it works well is that because the memory doesn't grow, because the shards are small, it evaluates them quite quickly, so you don't need, you haven't got this memory leaking problem yet. So let's take a look. This is the pseudocode of the algorithm. Uh, I'm sorry if some slides are very verbose, but I believe that people would be downloading them later on, so that's just how I made them. So it would be some knowledge for later stages, okay? So this is how it works. So take a look. For all of those, for all of those who work with graph, work ever with graphs. So we are talking about Mac Mini, Apple, 8 GB, gigabyte of RAM, 256 gigabyte SSD, Intel Core i5. So this is by far not the best of computers you can have today. By far, this is the very, very average laptop. And when you come to with these algorithms to live journal, 69 million ages, it's half of the minutes. Netflix, 99 million ages, half of the million vertices, one minute. Twitter, 
42 million, 1 point terabyte, 1 point billion edges, sorry. 20 shards, 2 minutes. Yahoo Web, so this is like 37 minutes. Trust me, when it comes to graphs, these are big numbers. And if your app ever gets to something like Yahoo, buy me a pint, okay? Please find me and do that because you would be capable of doing so. So it's definitely fast, it's definitely great, okay? So what can you do about it? As soon as you split it into graphs, as soon as you load it into your framework, which is the graph G, so the, the, re the rest is quite easy. It's not a problem. You can do many different things. You can calculate cycles, because now you can measure it. You can calculate your cycles, and the question of how how long of what the period of time you should take into evaluation becomes a very simple question because you can actually track it. GraphG allows you to define your custom data on every edge and on every vertex. So you can do it everything by yourself. You can add more and more information about your users. You can add information about paid users, free users. You can add information how viral those users are. You can actually build your own data structures, graph data structures, which would be very, very quickly and easily evaluated. It's an open source, so go out and try it. You will enjoy it. It doesn't require much. Those who know how to program in C++ will benefit, but it has got been implemented also in Java and, and Scala, so three languages, and it's very easy to use. And the possibilities are quite endless. Now, triangles is not the only thing you can use on your graphs, because as soon as you have a graph structure, as soon as you have a graph structure, you can actually apply all those things that you know. You can go with something like page rank, yes? So, it's a famous algorithm which Google has, Google has implemented for their, so you can, you can build a graph and you can see how many users are connecting with other users and you can find the users which are the, actually the source of the most important users on your graph. And as soon as you find the most important users on the graph, which are very well connected with other users, those are the sources through which you can propagate your games, your, your features or whatever it is that you are doing. There is a HITS algorithm which will allow you to split things into two different things like authorities and hubs. So then there you can split those users who actually give things to others and those users who are ready to receive things. So again, and those are algorithms are all the shelf and you can find implementations of them everywhere. It would be very easy to bring them into GraphG. You can go into all sorts of different centrality measures, which is again quite easy and doesn't require any extensive knowledge of programming today. So that would help you to understand, again, how central your network and where does it locate it all and what those people are and what those users are so you can find the centrality of, of your networks. So the possibilities are endless and all you need to do is just you need to present your, your network as a graph and then all the questions of K-factor becoming very, very easy ones to answer. 